Okay, hello, welcome. So good to see everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. Glad you're here for um, the kickoff of the Voices of Gen U series. So I've been looking forward to this one. I've never seen a church do anything like this. So um, listen, if this doesn't work, we'll go back to what wasn't working before, okay? It'll be wonderful. But I think that it is going to be actually something that, uh, that we'll all benefit from if we approach it in the right way. So I wanted to talk for just a moment about why the Voices of Gen U series, and then I want to talk about what it is that we're going to be doing here. So uh, in thinking about why Voices of Gen U, the title is kind of a dead, uh, a dead giveaway. Voice is more than what happens whenever like air passes over vocal cords and something comes out. A voice is something that's personal. A voice is like a signature. So Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and they follow. And so what we're wanting to do is hear the voice of the shepherd coming through the voices of the people that are in our congregation, right? And these are going to be very unique. They're going to be individualized, authentic, personal. Don't come up here, expect, don't come into the room expecting like a full-on sermon necessarily because I don't think that's what you're going to get. Although I kind of don't know what you're going to get, to be honest with you. Nobody sent me their script. Nobody sent me their outline. One person offered, I said, no, I want to hear it with everybody else. So I'm going to be listening for what the Lord is saying just as much as you are. Uh, second, the word voice is linked to the Latin word vocare, and the Latin word vocare is where we get the word vocation. So your vocation is what you're all about. It's more than what you do at your work. It's what you're all about. So your life is a word from heaven. The voice of God is saying something into the world through your life, through your quirks, through your personality, through the things that God has, uh, the ways that God has designed you. And then third, it's, it's voices, plural, so it's not just one voice, it's voices, plural. The idea is that God is speaking through many voices. So I have the privilege of talking in some way into a microphone on a weekly basis. Pastor Phil will, will preach uh, most Sunday mornings, and that's great, and that's good. And it's also healthy to hear from other voices in the congregation, from people who are not necessarily full-time pastors, per se. In fact, in the early church, the apostle Paul ran into this problem to where he's like, okay, we're getting so many spirit-inspired voices happening during a service. We need some order for this. So he's like, one, at the most two, now he's talking about speaking in tongues, but that ought to give you a clue that there were voices that were speaking in the early church. And so this, I think, resonates with the spirit of that. And then fourth, voices of Gen U. I love hearing people from out of town. I love hearing guest speakers as much as anybody else, but I'm really excited about hearing the voices of Gen U, our people. So now what? You're going to hear from uh, two preachers, well, speakers. They may shirk the label preacher, but they're going to be proclaiming the good news to you tonight. Uh, two uh, speakers each night. They'll talk for about 15 minutes, and then I'm going to come up here and join them on stage, and then I'll interview them and just draw out some things that I will hear for the first time with you. But I also want you to be listening for what the Lord is saying to you, or maybe you have a question about something that they said. And I guess that's another way that it's the voices of Gen U, because this is about drawing out your voice as well and hearing from you. So our uh, first speaker tonight is Elsie Miles. Now, Elsie is not a stranger to so many of you. Many of you know her. In fact, many of you just went through the freedom experience uh, with Elsie. She and her leadership team uh, of the Freedom Women are leading a revolution among women in our congregation. So uh, when we were praying through who to have do this, her name just came right up to the top. So would you please welcome her as she comes to bring the word to us tonight? Oh, you guys are too kind. Thank you. First of all, I want to say thank you for the people who came out to hear me specifically to speak. Um, this is going to go one of two ways. It's going to go really good or really, really bad. So, um, but on the way over here, I wanted to share something with you briefly before I started, just to kind of ease my nerves. I have been in my head all day and, and real nervous right up before I stepped up here. 
And I was on the way in from Red Bay, and I'm praying, and I'm asking God to give me, you know, something just to get me out of my headspace. <laughs> and I've asked permission to share the story. So <laughs> I'm driving from Red Bay to Freeport, and I look over to the right, and I see someone I know sitting on the front porch in a robe with their legs crossed. And I said, no, that couldn't have been. That couldn't have been. So I text this person. I said, was this you sitting on the front porch with your robe on? And immediately I get a response back, yes. And what was so funny about this is this person was Alicia Brown. And I, I was thinking about two minutes before that, listen, I need something to open up with, something just to break the ice. And Alicia is like my person I go to for my comic relief, her and Candy. But she, she just popped into my head. And I didn't have to call her at all. So you see how good God is? He's like, okay, Elsa, you've been way too serious. Let's just bring this down. And <laughs> she's sitting on her front porch with her leg crossed. Like, she says, I didn't think you could see me. I said, yeah, I could see you clear as bell. It was perfect. But anyway, um, that's just uh, something between Alicia and I that uh, you, I guess you just have to be there. I don't know. But anyway, I wanted to open up first by talking about a story in the garden. Everybody who knows me knows that I love the garden. Um, and uh, Genesis 3, 5, actually I have that marked. What I'm going to be talking to you about tonight is the kingdom within. And if, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me if you'd like, but it's 3. And it starts in verse 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. Um, that's the first indication that outside forces were beginning to move in the garden. Okay, now remember the serpent was already in the garden, but he had no control. He had no control over her or Adam. And just go on briefly with me. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And so the minute that they partook of the fruit, whatever it was, uh, it doesn't say what kind of fruit it was, but the minute that they did that, their eyes became opened. What was first thing they do, they begin to look at the external things. Now, they had no ability to know the difference between um, evil and good. They only knew good. And so the minute that they took that fruit, their eyes opened, and they were able to then see the things outside that were going to be coming in and causing distraction, causing them to want or desire. She looked at the fruit and saw with her eye what? That it was desirable, good for food. And so, and then as soon as she partook and gave to her husband, and the fir first thing they see is that they're naked. They're observing. They're observing a kingdom now outside of themselves. And so tonight, uh, as we talk about the kingdom within, one of the questions or the question posed to us speakers is, what is God doing or saying to you? And my walk has been um, quite colorful. Um, but it's been one that's been both challenging and exciting at the same time. Um, I, before I came to this church, uh, I had, um, I was in a non-denomination. I was really unchurched up until that point. I mean, we went to church some when I was younger, but um, my first church was very legalistic. And so when I was first saved there, I, I as a list of rules that I had to conform to. And in the beginning, that was good because those rules actually gave me a place of safety. You know, the, the law was a place that I could, these are the rules, you follow them and you'll be safe. But that same thing became my prison. It held me because I knew that there was much more that God had for me. He talked about this abundant life, this abundant life, this abundant life. And my first question to him was, what is this abundant life that you speak of? I don't feel it. So I try to make it. Uh, I try to perform. I try to be a people pleaser. I try to do more and more and more and more because when Jesus found me, I was in an awful state. I mean, I'm, this is, tonight is not about my personal testimony, but those of you who know me and know my testimony know that I came from a very bad past. And when God found me, 
it was like, it was an immediate thing that he did in me. And uh, I have never stopped serving him since. I've always had a lot of questions. You know, I've always wanted to be um, everything that he wanted me to be because I had spent the first 41 years of my life living it for me. And the last part of this, I wanted to live for him. So there was nothing off limits for me. I was wanting more and more and more and more and more. But trying to get the more on the outside of me was killing me on the inside. And so that brings me to Luke 17, 20 through 21. It said, once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. And the Pharisees, see, the Pharisees were considered, now I'm not saying that they are good, but they were considered good because no one's good. The word tells us that. But the Pharisees in their day, they were considered good. They tried to keep the law. You know, they even made new laws so that they wouldn't get close to the law. So they were actually respected and revered by the people around them. But when Jesus came, see, Jesus came and he says to the Pharisees, and in Matthew it talks about this. It says, uh, this is the NIV version, you blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of your cup and dish, then the outside will also be clean. And I'm not a Greek scholar, but I did look this word up. And within, or which is within, means inside the soul, inside the being. And so those kinds of things, as I'm a word person, really begin to trigger these thoughts in me. What was I missing? This abundant life had to be there that was in the word. It had to be there because the word doesn't lie to us. God's not a man that he would lie to us. The word tells us that. And so I begin asking this over and over and over. And lo and behold, the question was answered with my question. I ask the question, and if you listen to it, you'll hear it yourself. Where is this life of abundance that you speak of in your word? I asked that question for years. For years I asked that question, trying to find it, trying to create it outside myself. And then I realized that the answer was in the question. It's in your word. It's in your word. And uh, what, I guess what God's doing in me then in this season is he's taking the outside and he's bringing it to the inside. You know, one of the stories that I told Pastor Phil when I first came here, um, my knees were knocking because this church held a part of my past that I was going to have to face and embrace and be healed from. And I told Pastor Phil at a funeral, I said, look, I'm coming home. I'm the lady at the well. I'm not trying to stir up problems, but I'm coming home. And he just looked at me and said, come home. Just come on home. And that took me by, you know, it took me back. But like the lady at the well, uh, and, and you guys will have to, you know, maybe correct, correct this on Sunday. I don't know. I might be saying something wrong here. But um, one of the things that Jesus does is he reveals himself for the very first time. I mean, they ask the question, but he never really answers it. But he reveals himself the very first time to who? The lady at the well. She asked him. and He said, it is I. It is I. Now, why did he choose a Samaritan woman that he was not supposed to associate with in that culture and time? Why did he choose her to reveal himself to? A woman that had been married, not even married, she was living with the fifth one. She wasn't even married to him. But when he did that, when he had this conversation with her, she knew that he knew her somehow. And because he knew her, something changed inside of her. And he says to her, you know, I... Uh, and I know I'm not going off this outline, Candy. I'm sorry. But I said, I said, why would he do that? And if he would do that for her, he's no respect for persons, why would he not do that with me? So the minute that I understood that I, my shame, my condemnation, the things that I had held uh, as this, this uh, trophy somehow, that I felt like I had to prove to people that I wasn't that person anymore, that God revealed himself to me intimately. When nobody else would touch me, when nobody else would talk to me, Jesus revealed himself to me. 
And when he did, I did what she did. I ran and would tell everyone, hey, you know what he did? If he can save me, he can save you. I've been married five times. I've done this. I've done that. You know, he can do that for you too. And so I, I, I spent seven years probably um, reading just his word. I had never read a book except for in high school that I had to read for a test. But I read the Bible for seven years and I wouldn't read, any, I was legalistic. I wouldn't read any other book. And I had so much knowledge about the word of God and I was teaching it and I was writing Bible studies in my home and I was, I was actually teaching these things but it was all up here. And I couldn't get it to my heart. And I had some friends that mentored us that says, you know, you know the word, but you got to get it down in here. But as long as I held it here, see, I wasn't able to let go of the shame, the condemnation, the things my past kept pulling me down to. You see, we all have an ego. And our ego is fed and identifies with the external things around you. So it's normal. It's a normal thing for you to be saved and not understand that that spirit that lives in you has to be fed. It has to be fed, just like the external parts of you. But as long as our ego is in control, you will never find that abundant life that he's talking about. You will never find it. It doesn't exist because you will fill it with shopping. You'll fill it with more things. You'll fill it with um, um, idolatry. You'll, you'll, just, you'll fill it with something. Because that hole is designed for the Holy Spirit. And then even when it comes to live inside of you, there's this process that you have to go through of surrendering to it and allowing your flesh to be crucified. And, and, and it's a daily process. No one really arrives. You're justified, but the sanctification process is a walk. It's a journey. It's a process. And so nobody gets it right every time. And nobody gets it right completely perfect until we get to heaven. But what, I'm, what I want to kind of challenge you to do um, with me, because I'm not there yet either, is let's not sit idle and look at the things around us, because as long as you're trying to fill something in your life that's causing this black hole, uh, you know, one of my things is I like to buy shirts. Like, my husband can contest to this. You know, shirts in and of itself is not bad, but even if they're $5, but Mike said, well, five times a hundred, you know. So, but why do I do that? Shopping is not, in and of itself is not bad. But shopping to fill a hole or to make yourself feel adorned, or, and I'm just using shirts because it's what I know, shirts and shoes. But I'm just telling you, we're living in these last end times because we've been living the last days since Jesus died on the cross, but we're in the end times. And... We have this hope that lives inside of this mystery that they talk about in the Word of God. It's being revealed in the, the body of Christ. And if God can do this in me, he can do it in every one of you. And we've got to understand that the pastors standing up here, the, the people who lead us, they're not responsible for igniting the Holy Spirit in you. That comes from you surrendering. What they're responsible for is to equip us and send us out to do the work of the kingdom. And so if you're sitting around waiting to be fed and waiting to be fed and waiting to be fed, you're going to get fat. You're going to become spiritually fat. And listen, this is, I'm not saying that this is easy. It's not easy because I've had to crucify my temper. I've had to learn how to be a godly wife coming from an, a background of totally taking care of myself with my sister since I was 13 or 14 years old. So you, you, you have come from a past like that, and you walk into this place of salvation through faith. I had to accept. There's three things that has to happen. You have to accept or acknowledge. Then you have to become aware of it, and then you have to apply. So becoming aware of this living presence inside of me has been both exciting and frightening. Because once someone once said, to me that the, the um, secret to life is learning to die of yourself before you die. And then death loses its sting. So all these things in the scripture, they really come to life. They mean something. They're not just idle words. And I love the word of God. 
I love the word of God, the written word of God, and the, the things that's in it, but I love the word of God. Because I can talk to you all day, but if I'm not walking out the things that the Holy Spirit is, is teaching me, then I'm fooling myself. I'm deceiving myself. And we'll wrap this up um, by giving you some of my closing thoughts. The word says in John 14, 12, that I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. So when he left to go to the Father, he didn't leave you uh, powerless. He didn't leave you helpless. He said, it's better that I go because if I go, then I can send the comforter, the one that will lead you into truth, the one that will guide you and teach you. That's a gift. And we can't leave that gift untapped. Just, you know, it, it's not okay just to say, I believe and I am saved and I'm going to get into heaven. Man, if you knew your purpose, if you knew exactly what God had for you, you wouldn't want to be anybody else but you. There would be no jealousy. There would be no competition. There would be a, a culture of honor in our body. If you learn how to honor, you know what causes honor? When you give honor. When you show. You can't tell people how to honor, but when you show people how to honor, they honor you back. The kingdom outside of you has to fall. Because if it doesn't fall and you keep reaching for the external things to identify, your ego is going to grow and grow and grow. When I say ego, I'm saying there's a throne that's set up that we say, oh God, we surrender to you. But our ego says, we surrender to you, but we want to do it our way. Crucifying your flesh is not fun. It's not fun. No one said this was going to be easy. Pastor Phil's taught us this. How many years? No one said in the word of God, and it's not been preached in this, in this house that I know of, that it's going to be easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. There is not one of you sitting in this room, living and breathing, that doesn't have a purpose. And it's, it's, a, it's not a purpose of getting up and going to work. It's not a purpose of being a mom or a dad. It's a purpose of divine destiny. And it could entail those things. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that there's something that is living and breathing in us that heals that can cast out demons, that can encourage and exhort and lift the body of Christ up. And you have to awaken to it. You have to acknowledge it and accept it because it says, it says right here in my notes because I, I know it's true because I got it from the word of God. If I can just find it. <laughs> remain in you. Remain me and I will remain in you. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do. Oh, I read that one. Sorry. No, wait, no, don't, don't give up on me yet because I have, to, I have to read this one to you. Your kingdom come, your will be done in earth, on earth, whatever you want to say. The bottom line is this. He came upon the earth to show me and you how to live. He sent the Holy Spirit to live in me to help me be part of co-laboring with Christ to bring heaven on earth inside of me. So it doesn't matter. Don't get hung up on the in and the on. I mean, I can do that because I'm a word person. But don't do that because it, it defeats the simplicity of the gospel. It just, it, it just, I don't know. I just, I'm very passionate about where God's taking this church. And I'm very passionate about the freedom that I see being released over the body in our church. I, I am so honored. I am so honored that I was allowed to step into the position to be able to speak. But what I really wanted you to do is to see what's happening in me and not to put anything on you. I want you to see that by being in this environment, being under the leadership that we have, to be able to be free to move and operate in the spirit of God is something that we all need and it makes you feel alive. It brings such joy. So the abundant life you're looking for isn't outside of you. It's inside of you. Is it inside of you? So when you crucify yourself more and more and more and more, yes, it's hard. And yes, you're going to need help sometimes. And yes, you're going to fail sometimes. But when you do that, the more you do that, the joy 
and the peace that he talks about in the middle of a circumstance when you get bad news, in the middle of your children, uh, you know, doing crazy, crazy things. You have this peace that remains. It remains. And I'm going to finish up and close by saying this. As I was preparing for this, there was a line on a song uh, by Lauren Daigle. But I changed the song because in the song that once and for all, she says, God, I give you all I can tonight. These scattered ashes that I have hid away, I will lay them all at your feet. From the corners of my deepest shame, the empty place that I have worn your name, show me love, I say I believe. Oh, help me lay it all down. Oh, let this be where I die. My Lord, with thee crucified, be lifted high as my kingdom fall once and for all. Can I pray with you? Father God, I just speak a blessing over this congregation. Lord, I just pray that as my brothers and sisters that you've given me the awesome privilege to, to fight alongside, for them to rise up, for them to awaken to the power within them, Father God, and not for any other purpose but to further the kingdom. Lord God, I pray, I pray, I speak to every spirit, and I say, arise from the ashes, arise, awaken, accept the place that God's calling you to. Help them see themselves the way you see them. Let them identify, Father God, as a child of God and not as an orphan. There is no orphan in the kingdom of God. And so I pray a, a hedge of protection. I pray a deep-seated wisdom that comes in the night. I pray a blessing, a blessing, a blessing. And who am I to pray that blessing? I am a child of the Most High God. And I can proclaim a blessing. And I do, Father God. I thank you. I thank you tonight that you have given me the privilege to share my heart. Thank you, Father God. I pray that nothing that I've said or done has dishonored you, Lord Jesus. And I just pray that not one word from my mouth would be used by the enemy to cause shame, condemnation, or judgment. Judgment does not belong in a vessel of God that is reserved for the Father alone. That we are to love. And we are to love endlessly, tirelessly, Father God. And we are to, to always, always love. And I know that truth has to be part of that, Father God. It's a fine line we walk between the law and grace. But, Father God, you say in your word, the Holy Spirit will lead us. No man will have to teach us if we listen, if our eye be single, if our eye be single, that we can listen with our heart, Lord Jesus, and know what you're calling us to do. And I pray, Father God, that every person within the sound of my voice would know their worth before they lay head, their head down tonight. Thank you. In the Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for letting me share that. Oh, hold on to that because we're going to go right here. And there's a microphone somewhere out. Oh, there it is. I forgot I gave it to Walt. So Walt has a microphone over there. And uh, we're going to go for, let's do about 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Nine? I don't know. Like, where? Okay, I'm good. That was... Uh, yeah, I think that was a good, a good way to put it. You know, you, I, I think when it comes to preachers, you, you don't always remember what they say, but you catch the spirit of who they are. And so there's a, a certain passion, I think. You, you said several things that just stood out to me, but one of the things that you said was, um, and I was sitting over there by Becky, and I was like, ooh, that that you learn to die before you die so that death loses its sting. And I've always heard that scripture, you know, grave, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? Or however it goes. When did you, when did you come across that? Where did that come from? Uh, that well, you know, for the first seven years, I didn't read anything but the Bible. <laughs> but after that, I would read a lot of books, um, only the ones that the Lord had led me to. And I had read that in there somewhere, and it just kind of stuck with me. I don't remember who the author was or anything. But it just was profound because I think the words around that sentence didn't really make an impact, but that did. And I think it, it speaks to where I'm at right now, that I'm in a process of allowing myself to die daily so that I can be completely crucified in my flesh so that my spirit can live eternally. And so that, it's a, it's a trade-off. So either you live and you hold on to the things in the world or you let go of that. 
And that's a challenge for me, and that's just the way I live my life, so. It's really, you know, I don't know. It, it, it's almost something that the Lord just has to reveal to you. Yes. Like there's a certain grace and there's a certain grace in dying. I was actually standing, not, I'm not talking about physical death, but I was standing on my back porch this week and I just prayed to the Lord, help, help me die so that when I die, I'll be, yeah. it, it'll just be the, not, that, not in a morbid sense, just yeah. help me to die to my ambition. Yeah. Help me to die to my own dreams and, and help me to die to the thing that the, the ego wants so much. The ego loves performance. Yeah. It loves numbers. It loves attaboys and attagirls. And you, you said that the ego thrives on this out here, but the abundant life is inside of yes. you. Yes. So are you saying everything, what are you saying when you say the abundant life is inside of you? Like that's pretty, Yeah. that's pretty mystical. Well, for me, I can only speak for me and how, we, how God's speaking to me on this is that the harder that I hold on to something that needs to go, fall to the ground and die because something has to fall to the ground and die before it can be reborn. And so for me, the things in my life that I've held on to for so long uh, that I wanted to be in control of is scary. It's scary. But to die of self, is we make it uh, harder than it really is. Really, it's if we want that thing more than we want what's living inside of us, then it needs to go. And, you know, and that's not, I mean, I don't get it right. I don't, you can ask my friends, I don't get it right all the time. But my, my heart's desire is that there be nothing left of me before Jesus takes me home. But that's the, that's the act of sanctification. That's what we do. You know, when you look at the things that you're, don't let my desires be more than what he has and desires for me here. And a lot of times we do. A lot of times we want more uh, than what he wants to give us in a different way. Because what he has to give us is far greater than anything that we can hold on to anyway. But it's a, it's a, it's a big deal. I mean, you have to decide in your heart. You know, the, the line in the Bible that says, you know, be willing to lay your life down for a brother. Well, I took that literally. You know, um, am I willing, am I really willing to lay myself down for someone in need? And I don't necessarily mean die. I mean, I think at the time, because I'm a little radical, that, yeah, I said, I'm not sure I'm ready to die for this person, Lord, but if that's what you want me to do. You know, you can ask my husband. I'm, I'm silly that way. Like, if God's going to speak to me, I'm going to sit in the cemetery until that blade of grass speaks to me. You know, that's just the craziness that I kind of am with myself. So I don't want to discount the, everything I just said by my personality. But, you know, there's this is just part of who I am. And so I'm radical with the things. And so if he says, let it go, you let it go. All the prophets were a little weird. <laughs> now, here's, here's why I say that. I'm actually not joking. Like, they, the, the prophets were the people who, they weren't so much about predicting the future as they were about commenting on how life is in light of how God is. And when you take the reality of God's kingdom and compare it to the reality of our kingdoms, they just come across as radical, strange. It's like they're from the future because you're awake. Like you're awake. You're like, oh, you, you said in there, and I'm not I'm not saying that you're weird, but I'm saying to be I'm saying to be awake is to be a little bit is to be a little bit off the beat of culture and the standards that the world has set. They'll look at us and go, You're a peculiar people. Yeah, but yeah. I think I think the whole our whole existence and the sanctification is awake is really about awakening. It's, awakening. it's an yes. awakening every part of our, our inside spirit that lives there. Absolutely. And and, and it, as long as we allow it to sleep, it will. Yeah. And so I think that when I get discontented with what's going on around me, the problem is not with anyone or anything around me. It's me. Mm. You know, because the Bible says to be content in all things. And so how do you really do that? Well, you really can't. Holy Spirit has to do it. And so the Holy Spirit lives in me and you allow him to do it. And so, but it's, it's all about, for me, it's all about awakening all of the God in me. Yes, yes. And you said something earlier that some people, they, they get it, but some people take it too far. You said that I, I want all of me to die. And what you're talking about is the ego self. Yes. But what we want is Elsie to be fully alive, yes. right? Yes. We need the full you yes. out there. We need... We need all that you bring to the table to be you, 100% fully alive. Yes. So how, 
if you were to say and it, how to's when it comes to the spiritual walk, again, this is, we're out here in mystical land, right? To be a mystic just means you believe in direct encounter with the divine. So you, you already pray to a God you can't see that's mystical. You believe in a virgin birth, okay? You're already crazy, all right? Or you're just awake to life with God and reality. How, how, do we, how do we say no to the ego a little more and say yes to the abundant life, to the stream of living water? How, how can I do that tomorrow a little more than what I did today? Well, the only thing I can tell you is the way I started with this, and that is um, actually repenting and asking God to forgive me for taking his seat, you know, and to show me how to step down, how to take the lower seat. And, and, and you ask the Holy Spirit something, and he's going to walk you through that. But um, it's just a, it's a repentive heart. It's like saying to God, you know, I have tried to be in control. I, I have been sitting on this throne inside of myself, and I'm going to step down. And whatever that looks like, if I try to take control, show me. Show me, Lord. And it's a process. I mean, it's not something that you can really put your finger on because if you have a, a formula for it, then it's probably not going to work because it's going to be as individual as every person sitting in this room. And the, the beauty of what God is doing in me is that when I look at other people because of this, this transformation that he's doing in me, I don't see evil. I don't see bad. I don't, I, and this sounds, sounds hyper-spiritual, but it's, it's just my makeup, and those who know me well know that about me, that I'm not going to look for anything negative in people because why would I do that when I can pull out the gold in them? Because that is what's in me. And so I can only pour out what is being poured in. And anything that's being poured out that's not um, God is certainly not going to be, you know, looking at their sin because the sin is going gonna, is gonna to be judged not by me. I don't have to judge the sin. And so that's freedom. Woo, you know, that's gone. I don't have to worry about it. But as far as allowing the Holy Spirit, it's a simple thing. You just say, hey, take all of me. And whatever that looks like, because when you pray that, be prepared. Because it's going to look, it's going to be hard and it's going to be things that you're going to have to say, okay, somebody's going to hold you accountable. I have friends that hold me accountable. Hey, Elsie, that's one too many shirts this week. What's going on? You know, that kind of thing. I bought a shirt today. <laughs> we'll talk later. Yeah. I just remember it's actually a pair of pants. I'm sorry. I lied. Um, well, who has questions or comments? What resonated with you? What did you pick up? Like, what, what struck a chord with you? What was your aha moment that you had? Anybody? Speechless? No, it's just, you, you just, you just got to sit and make it awkward. Is <laughs> Jane, oh, wait, wait, look, everybody now, okay. So, all right, Calvin, then we're going to go, we have one more over there I saw somewhere. Miss Jane has one. I thought it was great to hear that you say justification is the beginning and then sanctification is the process. Yeah. I thought that was awesome. That, that was my aha moment. Thank you. I thought that was awesome when God showed it to me too in the Word. So. <laughs> but yeah, I wish I had thought about it myself. But uh, yeah, I, I recently studied that out because I hear the two words a lot. And that's another thing. You know, when you hear a word in the pulpit, don't expect Pastor Phil and them to explain it. Go home and look it up. And I didn't even know that justification, when they said just, you're justified, what that meant until I actually spent time with the Lord. So thank you. Thank you for that. I've been doing something a long time, and it's just praying for more of you and less of me. And that, when you said that, you know, you want to die to yourself, I think that's that's basically what we have to do is just I want him to show through me yes. Yes. Yeah. that's the thing is we're only vessels and so it doesn't matter if you're cracked where you come from what you look like you know what your gender is through those cracks the light can still shine and so you can't let the your past dictate to you your future and you certainly can't allow unhealed wounds and things to go un unchecked and if those things are still, listen, one of the greatest tools in your arsenal is repentance. Mm -hmm. And I say that because uh, I don't even know if this is good doctrine or not. I don't, I don't care. It sounded good when you said it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. All I'm saying that my greatest tool has been a repentive heart. I believe that. And, and always looking inward at myself before I ever 
look at you. And when I look at you, I'm not able to see any bad in you if I've been working on me. And so shining through the process, uh, Janet, what I love about that is it doesn't matter what stage we're in. Uh, we all come from different places. But our vessels are only to hold the presence and to pour it out. And, and you've been doing that well. So Authentic. Authenticity. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jane. Elsie, you're just on fire tonight, dude. Like, it's good. I, I, don't, the, the scripture that comes to my mind, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's going to be peculiar. That's going to be unique. And we need people that will just be like, here I am. Take it or, yeah. take it or leave it. Like, here's, and I just, I want to just affirm and commend the leadership that God's doing through you. I'm looking out over the congregation, and I, I see lives that, that you and your team uh, of, of, of leaders that have, that have poured into and there are so many more. I'm sitting here, I'm looking across, and I'm going, yeah, Crystal Belt could be up here tonight. And there's so many voices that God is raising up in this congregation. I want to hear what Kevin Keicher is, is thinking, you know. But tonight we got to hear from you, and you kicked it off, and you just crushed it. I was sitting here listening to you going, my God, that, she's as good as anybody on any stage, anywhere. Listen, so, the only good in me you I know, know is Jesus. I know this. <laughs> because I know this. you wouldn't like me otherwise. It was, thank God. Thanks be to God. That's why we're so awkward. One together. final question. We, we are awkward. It is. Uh, it's, we are, yeah, we are Thelma and Louise. Man. Um, just final question for you. When you saw my mom in her robe, what was your first thought? I mean, what went through your mind? Right God there? is so good. Thank you for answering my prayer so quickly. Yeah. Yeah, because I was like all up in my head. And I promise you, I, this is not a story I made up. And I didn't kick it off well because I didn't do it justice. But, but I was actually praying, God, help me get out of my head. And I turn and look, and there she is in her robe yeah. uh, with no shoes on, sitting outside like this. Yeah. And I'm thinking, here I'm being all serious, and yeah. God answered my prayer quickly. Yeah. That you're, wor you're worried about appearances, and there's a lady <laughs> sitting on her front porch on Highway 331 Whom I love. in a robe. I love you, Alicia. And I'll tell you this, and I say this in all sincerity. She teaches me not to care. <laughs> And I'm, I'm learning. Or her that. response to me yeah. on the text was, "Yes, I'm waiting to come and see you." Yeah. <laughs> That's what she said to me. There you go. She's the answer to your prayer. <laughs> yeah, mine too. She Love is. you, mom. All right. Well, I, Elsie, I feel like we've gone as far as we can go. We thank would just you. start meddling if we did anything else. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to uh, introduce our next speaker to you. And so Ed is the outlier in this series because Ed, Ed if, you, if you know anything about Ed's story, you know that he was a children's pastor here for a while, an executive pastor role, and then moved to uh, Ohio and was a pastor there. He and I uh, went to Russia twice together. And uh, this, this dude, and now he works for the government and does something something um, with the government. <laughs> he reads rocket books for fun. And the, <laughs> we ate Thai food on Monday together. And the more that I'm with them, the more that I'm just like, I love the way your brain works. And I love the way that you just love Jesus. And as brilliant as he is, his walk with the Lord just seems like, it's just basic, man. This is what we do. And so I, I love this brother, and I'm deeply grateful for everything he's poured into my life. And I'm sure that if you ever heard him preach, you would say the same. Would you welcome yeah. Pastor Ed Deming? I'm glad he brought that to my memory about our trips to Russia because I was... One of the greatest privileges I had with Pastor Tommy was on the first trip that he went to Russia with us, he experienced snow for the first time in his life. And so we were in this, it was called a great room. It was a large room about the size of this closed in area. And we were doing things with orphans and we were just getting to know, we'd been there only a couple of days and a few of you here were on that trip. 
And uh, we were just getting to know things, and we looked out, and the snow started falling, and we kept doing our thing, and he kept looking out the window, kept pulling the curtain back and looking out. Do you remember this, Pastor Tommy? And finally, he came up to me, and he said, Ed, Ed, he said, can we just go outside for a few minutes? I've never seen snow before. I was stunned. So we did. We stopped everything and went outside and hung out in the snow for a little bit. I forgot about that, but I think I related accurately. That's how I remember it. If it's inaccurate, that's okay. Let me just waddle in my own brain there for a little while. Amen, amen. How many of you like parades? All right, yeah. yeah so how many of you don't like parades? See, there are people who don't care for parades. Yeah. Uh, what about big shows like Broadway shows or musicals? Uh, you like musicals. We like that. Some of you don't like musicals, but maybe you like opening ceremonies, like at a Super Bowl opening ceremony or, or the Winter Olympics. like to watch things like that, right? We all like to uh, watch these kind of events that are called spectacles. Most of us have some kind of spectacles that we like. And you know, spectacle isn't a word we use much anymore. You should try to work it into a conversation tomorrow with someone. You could, and don't say my spectacles, because then you'll sound like you're, you're really old. But anyway, <laughs> this big uh, uh, demonstration, a show or something. How, how many of you like the, the, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade? See, I can't stand that thing. <laughs> I am serious, and I'm okay with my... People who I love in my household watching it. Doesn't bother me a bit. They record it and they watch it. And it just really turns my gut because I can't stand it. So I find other things to do. But if you want to bring a parade of tractors down John Sims Parkway, now we're talking about something I can really get interested in. You see, we all have the kinds of spectacles that we like. A spectacle is this striking performance of some kind or display. It's an event or, or a scene that is put forth to, to, uh, to demonstrate with visual impact. When we, when we use the word spectacle, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. And in the middle of the book of Colossians, in a few minutes, I'm going to read some passages out of the book of Colossians. It's the only book in the Bible that starts with C-O-L, so you can find it on your phones or whatever, you're, whatever you have with you tonight. We'll get to that in a little bit. But in the middle of this book of Colossians, God's word reminds us that he has provided for us the greatest spectacle through Jesus Christ. It was, our, it was and is, real time today, our spectacle of freedom. So the word that I'm bringing tonight is a word to believers. Uh, I'm, I'm really more of a teacher than a preacher, and I probably kind of straddle the fence from time to time, but... I'm much more comfortable doing what I would call teaching, but I'm not so sure there's a dramatic difference between the two. I guess if you're saying it loud, you're preaching. If you're saying it soft, you're teaching. I don't really know. <laughs> but I'm convinced that every believer here tonight needs to hear this word. And for some of you, this might be old hat, and you just say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think for most of us, it's going to be something that will really speak to your heart. And it's a message of freedom that is provided from one of my favorite passages of Scripture. So when Pastor Tommy said, hey, Bring whatever's on your heart. I thought, well, you know what? I have a few favorite passages, but this one resonated with me. And so if in a few moments, we're going to go into that book and take a look at that. But first, I want us to make sure that we understand just a little bit, a small bit about uh, uh, what the book of Colossians is about. How many of you have ever been to the city of Colossae? See, oh, man, a couple of us have. You've been over there. All right. Well, not many of us have been to Colossae, so when we read Colossians, we don't think about it being a city of people. It's just the name of a book of the Bible or the name of a letter. But Paul wrote this letter to those believers in a city called Colossae because although they had received Jesus Christ, and, and he, he testifies in the first chapter, although they are they're passionate, I'm using my own phraseology of what Paul said, but they were passionate about the things of God. Soon thereafter, they had been exposed to false claims and to false teachings. And those falsehoods that they were being exposed to were chipping away at their faith and, and whittling away at the strength that they had received through Jesus Christ. The false claims sounded real to them, and so they were threatening uh, the confidence that, that they had in the change that God had wrought in them. They were told by someone 
that continuing the Old Testament Jewish ceremonial laws and celebrations was required for them to be fully reconciled and walk to God and walking with God. They were told by someone else that they must avoid even touching or tasting certain things in order to be right with the Father. In fact, there was a very long list, and we won't go into that list tonight, but you can read it as Sister Elsie said. Pick up your Bible and read it. It's right there, book of Colossians. Take about 20 minutes to read through, maybe a little less than that. You can read through it and see that list. Some of those in that list had been handed down from the law of Moses centuries and centuries before. Before we get to Colossians, I want to talk about laws just for a moment, very brief. There are three kinds of basic laws that are covered in the scriptures. And in some capacity, they're mentioned here, but certainly through the rest of the New Testament. There are the moral laws of God, the moral laws. These are the laws that say it is against God's nature for us to murder someone else. The moral law. It's always immoral to lie. It's always immoral to worship an idol and so forth and so on. The moral laws of God. The Bible also talks quite a bit about the ceremonial laws. The ceremonial laws were the laws that came from Judaism. Back in the Old Testament especially, we see them reflected a little bit in the New. Ceremonial laws involve things like sacrificing bulls and doves. It involved attending and celebrating in various Jewish feasts and, and celebrations and ceremonies. Then there was a third kind of law, which was, will be common to all of us, and that is civil law. The civil laws of society. Civil laws involve things like taxation. How many of you love to pay taxes? I still never met anyone who raised their hand for that one. But tax laws and property laws and laws of royalty and inheritance laws and so forth, uh, our, our books of our, of our community are full of civil laws. And the Christians in, in the church in Colossians here, they were all about living according to the moral law of God because God's moral law is timeless. You can say amen to that. It is. In fact, in the book of Romans, the apostle Paul tells us that God has written his moral laws on our heart. And he said mankind was so hard-hearted that he had to write it down for us to really make it plain. But the writing it down only reflected that moral law that he already placed within us because he created us in his image and he is moral. God's moral law is and always will be his moral law. But the ceremonial laws are different. We're not going to talk about civil laws here tonight. That might be another time. The ceremonial laws were important requirements of worship before Christ died and rose again. For over 1,500 years, from the time of Moses to the time of Jesus, the ceremonial laws served an important purpose. They were the foreshadows, if you will, of Jesus himself. For example, one of the ceremonial laws talked about sacrificing a spotless lamb. And the spotless lamb that had to be sacrificed by the high priest was a shadow of the real spotless lamb who would one day come and sacrifice himself on the cross of Calvary. The Passover feast was a shadow pointing forward to the real Savior who would one day come to redeem and to save mankind from oppression and from death forever and ever. That was the purpose of that Passover lamb, to foreshadow the Christ that would come and completely fulfill that. So when Jesus came, he fulfilled those ceremonial laws. So no longer on a Sunday morning do we come in here and have Pastor Phil pull out his butcher knife and kill a bull on the altar. That would be in the daily news Monday morning, but that's not what we do anymore, right? We don't need to do that anymore. Because Jesus Christ, once and for all, fulfilled the role of the sacrificial lamb or the sacrificial animal as by the shedding of blood, there is a remission of sins. And therefore, by his blood, 
that was shed, we are redeemed and we don't have to kill animals in our house of worship anymore. I'm grateful for that, aren't you? Yeah. Imagine the flies there. No longer do we have to one time a year kill an animal and take the blood and sprinkle it on the doorposts of our house under the concern or even a celebration that something will happen if we don't do that because his blood was shed once and for all. You can say hallelujah for that. So Jesus fulfilled all that ceremonial law. So those ceremonies and those particular celebrations that foreshadowed him, once the real him had come, served no spiritual purpose anymore. They weren't a necessary part of worship because they had been completely fulfilled. Enough on that. We'll circle back to that in a moment. So as I said a few moments ago, God's moral law remained in effect because his moral law reflects his moral nature. And because each of us has sinned and each of us has fallen short of the glory of God's moral law, Colossians 1.21 tells us this. It says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope you held out in the gospel. That's powerful. It is the viewpoint of God that when we receive his son by faith, we are deemed and declared to be reconciled. We are, through the eyes of God, holy. Now, we don't like to look at one another and say, mm, Mr. Mike, you're looking at someone who is holy. <laughs> and yet, that is profoundly true. You should be able to look at yourself in the mirror because you have faith in Christ and say, I'm looking at a holy person, not because I think I'm holy or because Mike thinks I'm holy, but because the Lord himself has said, this is my holy child. Amen. You should give God praise for that. Talking about you. It further says about those who believe, down in verse 27, chapter 1. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Praise God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Another thing that baffles our mind, you don't have to understand it, but I challenge you to receive that by faith and to speak that by faith, that Christ is in me and because he is in me, that hope of glory walks and breathes in me. I may not feel very hopeful or glorious in a certain moment here or there, but it is Christ in me that is the hope of glory. It's not the me that's the hope of glory. It's the Christ that's in me. I'm an earthen vessel filled by the almighty power of God, and therefore there is a hope that resonates in me and comes out from my voice and the actions of my hands. In all my personal imperfections, the Father looks at me and says, there is a holy one. The Father looks at you and says, there is a holy one. She might not feel holy at this moment. He might have a whole list of things. But he's holy because he loves my son and has received my son by faith. Now, I don't think I'll surprise you when I point out that there are many, many ways your faith can be attacked. This is something that the Colossians were experiencing. But that's what the enemy of your soul does. He lies. When he speaks, he lies. He's the father of lies. But just like the Colossians, God doesn't want you tonight to be uprooted from your faith in Christ or what he's done for you. So beginning at Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6, we're going to walk through part of this together. I'm going to put on my 
I said, don't use that word about these. I'll put on my spectacles. See, some folk are listening, and I like that. That makes me excited. Teachers get excited about that kind of thing. Verse 6, chapter 2. He says this, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him. Not in your neighbor, not in the preacher on the television, although those can have their value. Strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. Hallelujah. In him, you were all so circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature. Paul here, as he does in the other passage, let's pause for a moment. He uses the, the rite of circumcision to reflect entering into covenant with God. In the Old Testament, that was the purpose of circumcision. With circumcision of the male child showed that that person, that household, was in covenant with God himself. And so Paul draws the, the parallel that when we come into Christ, we have circumcised off the sinful flesh, and God has deemed us to be pure and holy. It's an analogy that doesn't fit so well with our culture because we don't approach the idea or the practice of circumcision in the same way in our culture anymore, so it's a little tough for some to understand. But this was the context as he wrote this. Where am I? Verse 13? No, verse 11. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. And here's where it gets rich. When you were dead in your sins, I want to say that a different way. When you were dead in your sins, while you were dead in your sins, you were still dead in your sins. It was before you weren't dead in your sins. When you were dead in your sins and when the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations. And he's speaking here to those practices and those ceremonies that others around the Colossians are telling you, you got to do it. You got to start doing it. Even if you weren't raised that way, you got to start. You got to do this ceremony. You got to do that thing. You got to practice it this way or you're not right with God. Doing away with that, Paul says. I know God turned my page here, but I got to turn it back for a minute. Verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled that written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. We need to pause and talk about that for a minute. What is he talking about? A public spectacle. It's a phrase we don't use anymore. But the people in Colossae knew it very well because the Roman government had something that they did when they conquered a people, especially if it was a rebellious people or even more so if it was an outlying country that was standing up and resisting what Rome wanted to do. They would send in their generals and their armies and they would fight and conquer and for centuries Rome dominated that whole part of the world. And when that general and his officers had conquered those peoples, they would either march them hundreds of miles on foot 
or put them in ships and run them across the Mediterranean Sea or whatever it took, many of those, sold, of, of those uh, prisoners of war would die on the way. But whatever, whoever was left and still alive when they got back into Rome, they would put on a spectacle. And the spectacle involved the general with his armies and all the regalia and, and their banners and their, their weaponry all shined in, in formation marching down the streets of Rome. And then behind them would be those that they conquered, stripped of their weapons, stripped of their armor, and stripped of their clothes. Can you imagine if we did that after someone lost the Super Bowl? Let's, I'm, I'm not causing controversy here. I'm just saying, let's say that the Vikings win the Super Bowl this year. Let's say they beat, who could they beat? Dallas. I'm just making up things. I'm not causing controversy in my household. I'm just saying. What if the Vikings win the Super Bowl? And we determined, the, the NFL determined that beginning this year, the, lose, the winners of the Super Bowl in their capital city, wherever they're from, in this case, Minneapolis, would march down the street in February. <laughs> and all their stuff, holding footballs and, and trophies high, and the crowds would be ticker taping them, and the ticker tape would freeze into ice before it hit the ground because it's so cold. But what if behind them it was required that the Dallas Cowboys would just be wearing the minimal of undergarments <laughs> and have to shamefully walk behind them down the street? We can't even imagine that. It's kind of awkward just me talking about it, right? It's, it doesn't fit who we are. We don't even do that when we fight wars, do we? We did away with that centuries ago. But that's what the Colossians knew. That's what they understood. They knew what a public spectacle was when a conquering peoples was paraded in shame, showing their utter powerlessness to do anything. Many of them no longer alive, and those that were left were going to be miserable, miserable the rest of their days on this earth. And that's what they understood when the Apostle Paul wrote that God has canceled the written code that stood opposed to us. And he did away with it by nailing it to the cross to this crazy implement of the Roman government that was the most shameful way to die, so shameful that Roman citizens were not even permitted to be crucified. And Paul says, by using that, God did away with these and once he had disarmed these powers and his authorities that stand against you and stand against your faith, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them through the cross. Wow. Give God praise for that. I don't know where I am, but I'm going to close. In verse 16... He concludes, this is powerful. Therefore, do not let anyone, and I will say including you, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival or new moon celebration or Sabbath day, and we could add today or whatever. We would. These are just a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is Christ. Powerful. Back in Colossians, or in chapter 1, verse 13, he says this. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, amen, and forgiveness of sins. I come tonight to declare to you this spectacle of freedom that demonstrates that Jesus Christ is the very image of God. He is the creator of all things, 
He is our Lord and the sustainer of all. He is the first to be resurrected forever. He is the fullness of God. He is blowing your mind. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Hallelujah. Would you just raise your hands and praise as I close in prayer? God, we honor you, Lord, for your goodness, God, for this spectacle that was demonstrated by our Lord on on a, on, a, on a Roman cross. But God, that that power that was released in that moment is still flowing for every man and woman under the sound of my voice tonight, God. We pray that you would cause us to receive this by your spirit. Let your spirit quicken it within us and let us be blessed afresh and anew. In your name we praise you and thank you for it. And everyone said amen. Thank amen. you. God bless you tonight. Dude, do you need your uh, glasses? Not to talk to you. Okay. <laughs> the preachers are burning the house down tonight. My word. I don't know if y'all are liking this. This is the coolest thing I've ever been a part of. Super good. Um, let's start with this. How does Kathy feel about the goatee? <laughs> well... Uh, I'll let you talk to her later, but I'll tell you how I think she feels. Okay. We decided a long, long time ago, way early in our marriage, that however we wanted to have our hair or our whatevers, that was okay with the other. <laughs> our beards, our What's eyebrows. What's the Greek word for whatevers? I'm just wondering. Whatever. whatever. And, and, and the, the things that we change and fix. Well, for the record, I like it. Well, and a lot of people really don't like it, and a lot of people really do like it. And so uh, I shave it sometimes. You, you know me long enough. I have uh, five or six different looks, and this is just well, one of them. Well, this is a good one. It's distinguished, and I think the anointing's in the good I'm not sure what that question had to do with anything, but anyway. It's a segue into my second question. Okay. You, you never ask a man what his wife thinks about something. You should just ask her. <laughs> Kathy, what did you think about that? Um, why... You are like an encyclopedia. You're a treasure trove of just information. I mean, you broke down three types of law in a way that I went, oh, I mean, I, I paid a lot of money to sit through Bible college and never understand that. Like, and you just broke it down. Out of all the stuff that was in there, why this message? Why, what is it about this that's clearly lighting you up? Uh, just, uh, just the reality of what God did through Christ put into terms that we don't understand with fullness unless we under, unpack the context of where it happened. But when we do that, we realize in this example, for instance, why this letter, when it was read the first time, Paul said, read it to the Colossians. Then he said, send it over to the Laodiceans because they need to hear it also. Well, what happened was is those folk heard that and they passed it on. And I use my understanding. They said, we got to hear it again. Read it again. Read it again. Because they didn't have it in books and study it. It was read publicly in a setting like this. So, they had to, so how many times did they have to have it read out loud to them? I don't know how many times I've read Colossians. 50, 100, I don't know. And still, there's so much to get. And so, but that's because there's a truth in it that resonates deep within me. Why? I don't know. But there's something about uh, that particular passage, chapter 2, that just, uh, it does something deep within. So, in other parts of that, of that letter, too, but in particular. Yeah, I just read um, Colossians and Song of Solomon. I understood more of Colossians. And... There's a part in there, that part didn't stand out to me, okay. right? So this trip through the Bible, it didn't stand out to me. But what did stand out to me, and you've said it, and Elsie said it, is Paul loves this word mystery. Yes. He uses it, like he's very fond of calling things a mystery. I'm curious if there's anything in the database about mm -hmm. mystery. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely there is. I'm glad that you tapped into that. Uh, yeah, he does. He uses mystery a lot in Colossians and in his other writings. There is something about that because we, uh, in our Western culture, 
tend to be less comfortable with mystery. I love how you explained what a mystic is. I have many friends in other places who, if you say someone is a mystic, they get a little freaky because we have let culture define mystic for us right. rather than understanding the biblical context of what the word mystic means. Now, I don't have the persuasive oratory skills to be able to overcome our entire culture and teach, here's what mystic means, but I'm glad you brought it up because we, are, we tend to be uncomfortable with it in Westernism. And I think, in my experience, in, a, in most Assembly of God churches, we're even doubly suspicious Absolutely. of the word mystery. But most of the church from the earliest days of the church in the days when these words are written were from the east, the eastern, what we would call the eastern part of the Roman Empire. Mystery is a natural part of saying there are things that we can't fully explain or understand, but we have to accept because they're real. Mm. And we're okay with that. We don't have to have everything, you know, compartmentalized, all lined out and outlined perfectly, that there are these things that God has put in place that are a little beyond our ability to, um, to uh, conceptualize or to define with these crisp lines. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I have, in the last 20 years, become very comfortable in, in walking in that, in reading. I mean, there are authors who talk about mystery and and the word mystery in the scriptures and what it means in the various places and so. But Paul uses mystery a lot. It was natural and normal. We would have thought he was a little wacko too. I do, I believe that. Yeah. Appreciated what you said earlier about prophets. Yeah. Absolutely correct. And uh, Paul was thought that way in many ways, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm continually, um, I'm grateful I'm grateful when I can sit in the presence of an anointed intellect that hasn't divorced itself from the experience of Christ's spirit. And that to me is the gift of a teacher in the body of Christ. It, it's more than information. Absolutely. It, it is it, it is the, the information. It, What's the word? What's the word? Come on. I, it, it's like, it feels There's like revelation. What? It feels like revelation whenever you have somebody who has just the information, but the spirit it is, is waking I'll help you, up you. To it. it crosses a line into inspiration. That's good. That's which better. literally means being breathed into by the spirit, yeah. and that brings revelation I to like us. That. That's good. It's not just information. Information is important, yeah. but information without the inspiration will never bring you to a point of revelation. And that takes a humility to be able to be open to that. Yeah, that's good. Because it leads us into mystery, and we don't understand it all. And we got to be comfortable with well, saying, the, I don't get it, but I accept it because yeah. God said it. Because it's a hindrance for us. I get a little yes. serious about this. I, you should, because it's important. Because we get in these arguments, I think, sometimes not with ourselves or with the enemy, who we should be putting down with the word or, or resisting. With, but we get in arguments with what God has said. Yeah, yeah. Because, well, I don't understand mystery, therefore, God, maybe you made a mistake here about me. Yeah. Well, God didn't make a mistake about us. Yeah. He knows exactly what he's doing. What, and I'm going to paraphrase, but the mystery is often the thing that's most real that we don't know how to explain. Absolutely. True. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Well, let's just stop. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I'm grateful for, uh, you know, this isn't, this could come across, a, and I know it's 748 and I'm done. This could come, a, this whole setup could come a little bit across like, you know, American Idol or whatever those shows are, where you find like, you find like talent out there, you bring them up on stage and they perform for a little bit. But what we're hearing is the word of the Lord. I was waiting for T.D. Jakes to spin around in his chair and hit the Coming button. through. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. And then Joel Osteen's like, steal. Joel Osteen. No, I got Steal. It. It's off the rails, Pastor Phil. We're, uh, okay. Wrap it up. Wrap it up. Well, yeah, so, uh, so here's the deal. Like, we're doing this four more times. And next week, where's Johnny? 
I love Johnny Moses. Johnny Moses is going to be up here next week. If y'all don't know Johnny Moses, you just don't know. And then uh, Christy Mann, I saw it. There she is right over there. So it's going to be Christy and Johnny. Christy didn't know she's preaching. I just felt it, and now she is. And so it's good. Now she's ready for it. And uh, I'm excited about this. Let the word of God dwell richly in you as you go from this place. And may the spirit who understands all mysteries wake you up to the fullness of all that God has for you. Amen? That's Praise it. Praise God. Good. Thank you. Thanks.